So we're going to do the National Inventory of Legal Materials next, and we've got five people who are going to be speaking. Um, who wants to start? I've got Matt Novak listed first. Uh, Matt, you want to start? Sure. Why don't you come on up here. Um, who's going to have computers? We have Matt, uh, Susanna, Sarah, Stephanie, and Andrew. Uh, anybody have presentations? I have a little one. Little one? Okay, so what I'm going to ask is that we... Um, that we keep this short and snappy, right? That we do five minutes on your chosen jurisdiction. Just give us a quick overview of what you got there, um, and hopefully there'll be some time left over for more general discussion. Okay, so we're going to start with Matt, University of Nebraska. Well, let me uh, correct Carl. He introduced this as five prominent librarians. I'll say it's four prominent librarians <laughs> and myself. Uh, I, we, we had, uh, I think, uh, Rich Leiter, the director on, at our University of Nebraska, was kind of contemplating being here, but last minute he uh, appointed me to be here, so he got me. Um, I don't. I can keep this real snappy. Uh, Carl asked us to address what's interesting about your state, and I would say, really, there's not a whole lot of anything real interesting going on in Nebraska in terms of putting stuff online, uh, that sort of thing. Everything, anything that's online is, you know, PDF dump sort of thing. So there's no big. Uh, digital download like data.gov type of content out there where you can just download a big XML file and go to town with that. Um, nothing is authenticated, nothing online is considered the official version. Um, what other topics I have to see here? Um, coverage is very sparse uh, for Supreme Court and of course appeals and material is strictly slip opinions, last 90 days, pull that off and then it's gone. So there's no, again, not, not official, not uh, authenticated in any way, shape, or form. Um, disclaimers are pretty pretty uniform, but it's all use disclaimers. There's no kind of click-through contract to use. It's just, you know, use it at your own, own risk sort of thing. So um, I'll answer any questions after, I guess, afterwards. But again, I, I guess quick summation is nothing really super exciting going on. It's just pretty run-of-the-mill uh, online. Stuff. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, for each of our five presenters, we made up some uh, National Inventory of Legal Materials playing cards that have <laughs> each of the 50 states on them. So, Matt, this is for you. Uh, so, who's next? Susanna? I'm here. Yeah, why don't you come on up? So, I want to say as Susanna's coming up, this is part of a national effort um, that was started by Stanford Law Library, Paul O'Neill and Eric Wayne are the law librarians there. Um, the American Association of Law Libraries has been instrumental in helping get this effort off the ground. They've been very helpful in using many of their 50 state um, organizations. So, we're going to put that right there. And plug in your VGA for it. There you go. And this is an effort that's also been going on through the um, AAAL, um, Ariel and Ariel Space has been organizing it. And each state, I believe, now has a committee of law librarians who are working on trying to gather the law for each state. I'm on the uh, committee for Pennsylvania, although I'm not the chairman of the committee. And um, I was just going to go to Pennsylvania real quickly. No, I said I was going to do County, but, um, Pennsylvania is fine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not from Illinois, so I'm not from Illinois. There we go. There's Pennsylvania. Um, and if you want to read all about how, um, where Pennsylvania law can be found, my boss wrote this fabulous essay that he updates all the time that gives you like blow by blow details about every possible source of law in Pennsylvania. Um, the Pennsylvania is basically the setup like the US with the judiciary, legislative, and administrative. This is our judiciary system. Um, those minor courts at the bottom um, are the ones that are decided by magistrates who aren't necessarily lawyers or judges, they're just sort of guys who get elected. And they handle two million cases a year, but they don't publish anything. Um, our common pleas courts are the basic courts that people start out in. And 
they're just starting to go online with their information. Um, and it's sort of like a county by county basis. Some of the counties have a lot of information. Some of them don't have any. This is the ministerial courts. Um, terms and conditions seem to get um, more and more dire as you go into the uh, smaller courts. I mean, this one is like, <laughs> if you use our system to magisterial courts, you know, you, we could, you could like blow up your computer, um, you know, just forget about it, and we have no responsibility for anything at all, ever. Um, loss of revenues, blah, blah, blah. Um, this is how you get to the common police sites, but then they quickly go to these local, little local sites that each county has put together, and they're, they're all different, they're all different map, and most of them don't have anything that you can actually cite to the non-authoritative. Um, this is another one. Then the, the appellate courts, the three appellate courts on the top are the Superior Court, the Commonwealth Court, and the Supreme Court, and they are all now posting um, authoritative PDFs of their opinions quite rapidly online, so that's good news. Our legislator lecture is putting some stuff online. Um, they have bills, and you can now get emails every day about bill progress as it goes through the houses, which I think is a good thing. Um, bill information, and then our codification. Um, <laughs> for a number of years, the only codification we had was done by this retired lawyer who was like in Philadelphia or something, and uh, it wasn't authoritative at all. And finally, the state talked west that publishes Purdon's Pennsylvania statutes to um, let them link to their um, unannotated Pennsylvania statutes. So that's provided by West, but again, um, we have a disclaimer. And as for our administrative branch, um, our code is online, which is just the rules and regs, and it's it's not very searchable, not very profitable. Hopefully they can improve that. Questions about Pennsylvania? Let me know. Okay. Great, thanks. Okay. And are there copyright assertions on the administrative regulations? I didn't see any copyright assertions. No. Your official playing card. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. All right, Sarah Glassman from uh, Valparaiso. You are doing Indiana and Kentucky. Indiana, Kentucky, and Illinois state level. Okay. Um, I just looked at the big six from these three states. So, um, complication of legislation uh, acts, Supreme Court cases, appellate court cases, administrative code, administrative register. Um, and also, I am the, now the Indiana chair for the AAAO National Inventory of Legal Materials. I just, <laughs> my coworker Sally Holderhoff was the chair, and I went up asking her just for some basic information. So. I didn't have to do too much research for this for the Indiana. Turned out they haven't done anything, and then I don't know, one thing led to another, and I get a call from Mary Alice Bates, and she said, Now you're in charge. So, <laughs> if you would like to participate with the Indiana, please see me, and I will gladly accept your help. Um, just in general, this is the first time I've, I mean, I've used these materials, especially the Kentucky ones. I'm recently from the University of Kentucky. Um, and so I kind of knew what to expect, but I was still stunned. Some general problems. Uh, the one, there is no one-stop shop in any of these three jurisdictions. You have to go to the, um, usually the legislature's page for the laws, that way, uh, court's pages for the case law, and then the admin codes are hidden. It's an Easter egg hunt, really, trying to find things often. Um, and then just kind of thinking like a pro se, which is always a fun adventure, I just Googled, you know, like Kentucky law, just to see what would happen. And in all these jurisdictions, you often got the legislature's page, but the court pages never appeared on the first page of any Google results. So that is a problem. Um, usability, again, a nightmare. Just the Kentucky uh, the court pages, I don't, um, we can Google it. I'm a great librarian, just Google it, you'll find it. Um, but the Kentucky court's uh, case searching, they use weird terms like stemming and fuzzy searching and things that I have never heard of before. I may even double check with some of my librarian colleagues. Like, am I just, did I just that day in class that we talked about fuzzy searching? They said no, they've never heard of that either. So. Usability is kind of odd, and again, it's not professional. I'm having trouble. Joe Q. Public is not going to be able to find this. Trying to determine whether or not 
it's official or authentic, it's very hard to find that. I mean, I've been working on this pretty much, I'm new at my job, so I don't really have a lot to do, so I've been able to really devote the past two weeks to this, and it's t it took me a really long time to really figure this out. Um, and again, PDFs were, were perfect uh, in HTML in the predominant formats of these laws, and then in many cases, the official version is only obtainable from a commercial publisher. Just some weird specifics, there are copyright assertions in Indiana. Um, the uh, head notes for the codes are have copyright assertions by Thompson. Um, older cases have uh, copyright state of Indiana. And then we have the official reporters for Indiana case law are North, uh, Northeastern reporter. And they just have like a blanket at the beginning, copyright Thompson Reuters. So, you, you know, again, you're not really sure do they just mean the key, the key numbers of the head notes or the actual text of the law has never explicitly spelled out. Uh, Kentucky does a kind of a weird thing, and this was one of the things that was really like, funny. Um, I taught the base for the base of the research for regular research um, for three years, always told my students there are two official versions of the Kentucky Code, one published by West, one published by Lexis. That's actually not true. The only official version of the Kentucky Code is electronic. It's in this database that's kept somewhere in Frankfurt um, that only the LRC staff has access to, really, but you can purchase a copy. The version on the web is not official, and Kentucky was the most explicit about having disclaimers saying, go with God if you want to use this. We don't, <laughs> we don't care. Um, so that, I just thought that was very weird. There's no statements about preservation or anything like that, but all I know is the electronic only. Um, and again, Illinois, this one, I expected Illinois to be a little bit better, just being one of the bigger states in the union, and maybe Steph can explain. I'm still a little unclear about the status of the Indiana, or the Illinois code, as far as what's official, what's not. So hopefully, yeah, the Illinois people. There, there is an official compilation, but not an official code. Right. That's the, that's my yeah. the, <laughs> uh, most practicing Illinois attorneys think that the Illinois State Bar edition of the Illinois Compiled Statutes is official, and it is not. And what they will cite to, um, but it's published by West on the ISBN. Okay, so that's <laughs> the status of that. But um, that's pretty much just a summary. Again, there's some things just like the Indiana Register, which are no longer printed at all officially. It's only electronic, and we get monthly CD-ROMs for that one. Um, so again, just that's the status of these three states. Great, thank you very much. There you go, official blank cards. <laughs> okay, uh, Stephanie, I think, uh, University of Illinois Law Library. We're doing this very quickly, by the way, but you'll find spreadsheets and other things online. Um, if you did use presentations, I would very much appreciate an email copy of those so we could use that for a record for this uh, law.gov process. So, Stephanie, it's all yours. Thank you. So I just looked at municipal codes for Illinois. I sort of intended to go through um, in kind of reverse uh, population order. And I wanted to get down around the 5,000 range. I only got down to 10,000. That was about 200 uh, municipalities. And I looked at the main code for each. A lot have you know, separate zoning codes, building codes that aren't contained in the main codification, and some of them have them unified. So the, the sort of overview of, of all of the, all of the municip municipalities in the 10,000 plus population group, 87% have a code online that I can find. Um, so that might be a little bit low bulk, because some of them are really incredibly buried on the city's website. And it, it's no, there's no correlation between size of the city and how easy the code is to find, or whether it's online, or whether it's um, you know, more available and easier to access. Some of the tiniest villages have really great access to their code and actually you know, make, um, make them more available, make them available right on their site. Um, but you know, they're difficult to find uh, sort of across the board. The, um, so out of the 180 out of that group that have online codes, a quarter of them are self-hosted. That was a surprise to me. So the city is actually putting them up on their own website. Mostly PDF, some Word docs, some HTML. Some are actually linking, deep linking into a publisher's website, but at least they're, they're providing the sort of table of contents on, on the city's own, um, own website. So spread between MCC, Municode, um, Sterling Codifiers, and AM Legal are the three big ones that people are using. And that has a big um, sort of a effect connection between, between that and then whether there's a disclaimer, a general disclaimer, whether there's a copyright assertion that, um, that's 
connected to, um, in many cases, the publisher or the codifier that they're using. So there's some kind of disclaimer about currency, completeness, authoritativeness um, in, in most of the things that I spot checked. Um, I didn't check every single one. And the language varied. Some of it was, um, there were click throughs, there were points where you actually got a little pop up that said, you're agreeing when you click through this that you're not going to hold us liable. Um, this is for informational use only, and that only the print copy kept in the clerk's office is official. A lot of language in the codes themselves about, um, you know, very 1950s sort of language that the official copy is kept in the clerk's office and the clerk shall, you know, interfile the new ordinances as they're passed and that's the only official copy and anybody else who has a copy, it belongs to the city and you must bring it back in order to get it updated and, you know, no, no revision of that sort of language. Um, not a lot of really specific copyright assertions, a lot of blanket copyright, you know, whatever the publisher or codifier um, on the site. There are some kind of prefatory chapters before the code starts where, where there is language that, that says um, copyright the, the codifier and the, and the state in joint. I want to I wanna really get in deeper to see how many of those um, you know, get that specific. And, uh, but again, with 75% of these codes on a publisher's website, I, I think it's fair to say there are a lot of copyright assertions on um, in Illinois. And then, um, Know, the only ran really random, completely random odd thing that I found was that at least three of these, and I know that I was starting to get a little uh, weary-eyed, but at least three of these cities have the exact same website, um, the same header with the same little blonde girl, the same person playing the flute, and <laughs> some old couple sitting on a bench laughing. It's the same site. It's really uh, bizarre. Those things are alive. There you go. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. We have Andrew uh, Plumler from Case Western. That's from the light out of your eye. Right, and I'm going to talk about Ohio, uh, which, uh, as the other states, does have a state working group that's contributing to national inventory. Uh, that group has not um, really done anything yet, and I was just notified by email that as of this afternoon, I didn't so you know this is the beginning of information that will hopefully go farther uh, I'm also new to the jurisdiction uh, having relocated from New York so um, the knowledge that I have is largely from you know, a couple of days of asking a lot of questions of my uh, colleagues in the library uh, and, and colleagues elsewhere in the state uh, the short answer is uh, that there is a lot of information uh, in a general sense um, available uh, publicly on the web, in online, outside of the, the large integrated the research systems. Essentially, none of it is official. Essentially, none of it is uh, authenticated uh, in any fashion. Um, we looked at municipalities, and actually, in contrast to Illinois, uh, with the sort of asterisk possible mysterious exception of Cleveland, uh, none of it is uh, sort of self-hosted or uh, directly provided by the cities. Uh, it's really all done through these uh, you know, third-party you know, codification firms uh, and then a third-party uh, hosting the, the material online. These are rife with copyright assertions, either in the city or in the, um, you know, the firm that provides the codification and, and publishing services um, in a mix of that. Um, and finally, these aren't, these aren't large, or these strike me as especially sophisticated outfits. So a lot of, um, uh, you know, HTML products that are, you know, served up in these kind of frame-based uh, table layout pages. Uh, you know, not the kind of thing where I have a lot of confidence that there's a, you know, a partner there or, or either, you know, within the, the third parties that are doing the codification services or within the cities themselves uh, to, to be at the point where, you know, hey, you want a, a stream of, you know, clean, semantically marked up, uh, you know, information. Well, yeah, we know, we know how to do that. We can, we can do that too. Um, the possible weird asterisk assumption is that 
the Cleveland um, codes uh, are um, actually they're a lot fine wall, uh, not in the, the length, you know, the outward bound lengths to um, outside material serves true with fine wall, but on fine wall, um, the city clerk of council, um, clerk of the city council, couldn't tell me um, why they were there, how they got there. Um, <laughs> referred me to the, the city attorneys uh, we'll speak to uh, soon. Uh, on the other hand, the, uh, the publication that is essentially the, the, the local laws publication for Cleveland City Record uh, was the one example of the municipal level legal authority in Ohio that I did find actually posted by the, the municipality itself on the, on the city website. Um, you know, as a, a periodic PDF, uh, although retained uh, for a significant period back in time. <coughs> the um, state um, statutory and administrative codes are both available um, freely on the web um, through uh, LawWriter, which is the, the technical part, partner for Casemaker, uh, is the firm that, that, that makes Casemaker uh, run. Uh, my understanding is that there is an exclusive arrangement so that LawWriter is the uh, exclusive online, you know, public internet um, source for, uh, again, both the statutory and administrative uh, code material for the state of Ohio. Uh, it's there. Uh, it's there. It's, again, it's, uh, it's HTML. It's uh, avidly disclaims its official status. Uh, the official uh, publication is, is a West publication. Um, uh, but it's there, you've seen. The uh, State Administrative Register is online, again, backed by the PDF dump. Uh, this is a publication that's only existed from 2000. It's online from 2003. Uh, I don't know what happened for the intervening year, I suspect really very informal in the newsletter kind of publication for those years and the visibility gap. Um, the um, Legislative Service Commission, uh, on the other hand, uh, so again, the, the, the legislative materials, does make bill analyses, uh, bill status reports uh, available online. There's actually relatively deep back file for those. Uh, once again, that is both in text files and in PDF files. Um, and they're text-based PDFs, so cut and pasteable, uh, mineable. Um, and the House and Senate journals are on the legislative websites um, as PDF files. Um, the courts, um, by contrast, are actually relatively sophisticated. Uh, slip opinions are available um, as PDF files uh, from 1992. Um, and they are also available from the 90s forward uh, with a, uh, what's, what they call, referred to as a website. Uh, and this is a, a, a platform neutral uh, unique identifier for the case. Uh, but again, those are the slip opinions. Uh, once again, the Ohio official reports uh, is a, 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 a West publication. Uh, and the um, material from the state Supreme Court, from the state intermediate appellate courts, um, is that there's a um, you know a Pacer-esque uh, electronic case management system uh, that can be used relatively uh, effectively, and a number of the county courts. So the um, uh, the, the, the major case trial courts. Um, also have online copy systems, and in some cases, um, filings and um, actual materials are available through those, uh, those copy systems. Great, thank you very much. Again, your official plug time. If you are a certified librarian, we also have um, buttons for folks. <laughs> Who's the certifying authority? Uh, not me, that's for sure. Uh, I come out of an engineering world and we used to work for t-shirts, not money. So, um, I want to take a step back on this national inventory and explain at least three reasons I think this exercise is important. 
Um, now you'll notice this is not a, a totally rigorous process and that's actually on purpose. Rather than sit down and design the ultimate form and ask people to fill that out, the hope was to do a ground up assessment of a variety of jurisdictions and that over time this might get more rigorous and more formal. But there's really three reasons that, that this is useful. Um, reason number one is aggregate statistics. Um, I went and saw the chief judge of a district court who shall remain unnamed. Um, and I explained to this gentleman that several states, um, eight at last count, asserted copyright over their state statutes. And this federal judge is jaw dropped. He was amazed because he understands the Supreme Court decisions that are very clear that say there is no copyright on state statutes. Um, and this is not copyright over head notes, over page numbers, this is copyright over the statutes themselves. Um, so these aggregate st statistics are very, very helpful in convincing policymakers that there's potentially an issue here that needs to be addressed. The second reason is for comparison among jurisdictions. It's real easy if we're in one state or another state to say simply this is the way things are. Um, I was surprised when we were down in Texas where Terry Martin was hosting the workshop and we had a lot of state officials from Texas there, the CIO of the courts and the clerk of the court and you know they have all their dockets online for their courts. I think there's one that is a holdout that doesn't do that but as a general rule if you want to go in and get, get information in a clueful fashion available for bulk download it's there. And that's compared to for example California where it's not the case. And we think by documenting these issues of, you know, is there copyright on, on municipal codes? Um, are they outsourced or are they in-house? Are they available in bulk? Um, can you use them? Do they cost money? And being able to compare them on different jurisdictions, that's going to be a very useful lever as we go brief state officials. And then the third reason is to document barriers to entry. Uh, because one of the primary contentions of Law.gov, remember Law.gov is not about taking West out. It's not about building the ultimate website. Um, it's not about replacing you know, legal education with some new, new thing. Uh, all those might happen, might not happen, but this is really about uh, issuing documents that have the force of law. And this is about convincing government that if they were to issue those documents, be they executive, legislative, or, or judicial, they should be available in bulk, and they should be authenticated, and to the extent possible, it should be the full archive, and I understand if we're looking at all congressional hearings or other things, that's not easy to do today, um, but that over time one should strive for that goal, and the reason is because you want to be able to get into the business of accessing these documents, and we've given several examples um, I've used a number of 10 to 50 million dollars to get into the business of serving case law for the states and the federal government. That's based on some agreements that I had with a major publisher in which they offered to sell us the equivalent of that stuff in the federal reporter and, and the Supreme Court decisions. Um, and I've had that number verified several times. But it's also for nonprofit uses. If you are Cali or public.resource.org or the Civil Rights Clearinghouse at the University of Washington, you cannot afford to download these materials and do things with them. And we've seen time and time again that when those barriers are taken away, in the case of the state of Oregon, for example, which asserted um, copyright over their revised statutes, all you had was one website, and it was the one run by the Legislative Council, and it was pretty bad. And the minute they took their copyright assertion over, uh, a couple months later, a 2L at Lewis and Clark, who happened to have a computer science undergrad, took the Oregon Revised Statutes and built this amazing version um, that has correct HTML and a UI, and you can navigate it, and it's available in bulk. And that's one of the things we're trying to document with this national inventory, that if some of these copyright assertions and paywalls and lack of an inventory and official reporters and um, lack of official reports um, if some of these barriers are taken away, that, that a huge amount of innovation and public interest legal education will happen. Um, so I want to turn it over now to other people so we can hear comments, uh, starting with the national inventory, if there's any questions or comments on that. I will ask our camera person here to um, start manning the camera, if okay. you will, so as other people are talking, we can get them on film. So do we have any comments on the national inventory to start off with? Any questions for any of our... Of our commenters, um, any feelings on whether this is a useful exercise or not. Um, we have a lot of librarians here. Um, 
I'm Suzanne Lewis. Um, one of the things that I noticed as I was kind of looking at all these various websites is that it might be helpful if we end up sort of ranking them or giving them a grade, like how good your, your how available your law is. I mean, some of the sites are just horrible, and they're, they can even be in the same state where they'll have a good website and a bad website. So they might sort of sit up and take attention more if we started to say, well, you know, you have a D in your, <laughs> we give you a D in grading, or, you know, even rank them like US News or something like that. That would make them I think that's a good sit up and take notice. Yeah, when, when we did the uh, privacy audit of the district courts, one of the things I did is I graded all the district courts on a curve based on the number of social security numbers per gigabyte. And the ones that got Ds and Fs are the ones that got the letters going to the chief judges. That, that's a good, uh, good suggestion. Somebody else? Uh, I Following up on that idea, in terms of you know, one step would be to tease out sort of what are the you know what are the criteria. You know, is it uh, you know depth of the back file, absence of a copyright assertion, some kind of credentialing, you know, quality of the markup. I mean, the list would probably go on from that. But, you know, just sitting be, down, somebody. And that would be a national effort. That's, that's something that we need to go outside of these. You know, if it's different in each of the state committees, it doesn't work. Kevin McClure, I'm from the Chicago Kent College of Law Library here. Somebody, and I can't recall now who it was, did a ranking of federal government websites at all three levels of government, and the court sites consistently came out at the bottom. So I don't know what it is about courts, but they seem to have the most trouble. <laughs> now part of it is staffing, um, and, and we do have to remember the courts are very much underfunded. And again, as has been pointed out several times, remember the clerk of the court and the CIO of the court does not work for us as the public. Their job is to administer the court workflow process and make it effective. Um, again, getting back to the privacy audits, one of the things we pointed out to Judge Rosenthal of the Rules Committee was that when the PACER documents were only available to on PACER for court employees who had no incentive to be searching for social security numbers because it was not their job, and it was also available on the commercial services on West and Lexus, and they had no incentive to search for social security numbers, certainly not for redaction, perhaps for data mining purposes for their products. It was only when the public got access to PACER that we were able to find those social security numbers and begin cleaning up the database. So public access and privacy actually come together. Um, same thing with bulk access. A lot of the innovation and, and public access requirements, I think, are only going to happen when, when we solve some of these bulk access problems. Yeah, and actually, in some respects, it's an interesting contrast that I, I, some of what I saw, again, just you know, a couple of days looking at material in, in my state, uh, in some ways the courts were actually perhaps best you know, of the, the, the institutions of government. Uh, there was still you know, a lot of headaches just in terms of you know, really interface design things, you know, uh, form validation on you know, crazy you know, entries that had to be there. Uh, so it made it very difficult to do uh, you know, searches that were anywhere in the middle ground between, you know, a, a real rough, you know, keyword, throw me everything, and I know exactly what case I'm looking for, and I'm going to give you the docket number. But the, the data being there, um, being there um, with a sort of clarity of what it was we were looking for, I mean, they were slip opinions, but I could tell that they were slip opinions, and I could um, work with them. Uh, it was actually better, I thought, than the courts, than some of the other. You mentioned the uh, problem of redaction, and I know that's been a key issue with some of the PACER materials, and it seems like nobody wants to take responsibility for it. And I guess until that's a, actually somebody's responsibility to actually accomplish, that barrier is going to be there, because it's a valid one. It's uh, too much personal information, not just social security numbers, in some of those cases, and someone <coughs> has to take the responsibility to clean them up before they're uh, put out generally. We had a long session on privacy at the Berkeley workshop. Um, we had uh, Peter Wynn, who's an assistant U.S. attorney, and Chris uh, Hufnagel. Um, a couple issues on privacy. Um, there actually has begin to, begun to be a bit of a change, at least in the PACER world. Um, because what's beginning to happen is the Judicial Conference has, has asked the Administrative Office to proactively scan incoming documents. Um, so they're beginning to actively look at it, not just say it's the role of the lawyer, uh, but it's also the role of the court if there's a particular issue, a, a particularly rampant number of social security numbers. Um, lawyers are now being required to affirmatively click 
every time they log into PACER, and some of them really hate that. And it says, you know, I, I understand my redaction responsibilities. And every time they file a document, they get a little blinky, have you redacted? Um, but I think the most important thing that's begun to happen um, is a lawyer in, I believe, the, the jurisdiction of Wisconsin filed a bunch of social security numbers and was fined several thousand dollars by the judge. And I think if that happens a few more times, um, I think somebody is responsible, and that is the lawyers filing the documents, which is what the rules say. That, that is, in fact, what Judge Rosenthal and the, and the Standing Committee on Rules has, has said, is that lawyers are responsible for making sure that happens. Now, there's a broader issue, which is that we have not, as a society, explicitly confronted our privacy obligations. We did privacy by obscurity. The theory was that the documents were inside of a paywall on PACER, and only good people had credit cards, so the documents were safe. Now, as we know, identity thieves also have credit cards. Um, in fact, they have more credit cards than we do. Um, <laughs> they have ours, but they have ours. <laughs> and I will agree with you that certain documents maybe should not be made available. For example, I had an opportunity to get a lot of bankruptcy court documents um, out of PACER and put them online. And I said, you know, I don't want that. I'm, I'm not convinced that those should necessarily be Google, you know, uh, on Google and available for everyone. And uh, se several of us here are on the front lines for that. Uh, Tim, J Tim and Justia, um, several other folks have these court appeals and basic docs available. And our phone rings a lot with people getting upset about these documents being there. Now, in the past, what's happened is these documents have not been private. They've been available on what I call the rich man's Google, on, on West, on Lexus, on, on Pacer. Um, and the courts have simply not decided whether a certain document should be available or should not. And a lot of the argument to the judges is, is it is not our job, right, to be deciding what documents should be available and should not. It's society's job through our mechanisms for deciding of privacy, and that means the judicial conference, it means the Congress of the United States, it means the executive branch, and those should be explicit decisions, not, not simply saying, we'll throw them out there for people that have money. Um, and, and I think one of the aims of law.gov is to explicitly confront the privacy issues and decide, um, are we unsealing documents improperly, right? And if so, should we put in better checks and balances to make sure that doesn't happen? Um, are we not enforcing the rules about, about social security numbers or names of minor children or alien numbers, which right now are allowed to be published on a website? There are no privacy rules that say you, you um, it's, you can't publish an, an alien number. And so what happens is if you sue the Bureau of uh, you know, Immigration and Natural, Naturalization Services, um, if, if you do an administrative action with them, your dossier, your docket number, is the equivalent of your social security number. And if you appeal that decision, and it goes to the Court of Appeals, the lower court docket number is listed on there. Um, so I got a call from a lot of folks saying, you've got my alien number up on your website. We looked at that and went to the court websites, and sure enough, it was just full of alien numbers. And the position of the clerks is that they were not told by the judges not to put those on. So when it came to social security numbers, they removed them immediately. Uh, but the alien numbers, they said, you know, I'm going to wait until the judge tells me to do this. Yes, we had several more comments. The issue of the bulk downloads, is there, do you, does law of government have a position about what the sort of minimum format or what minimum amount of metadata or anything like that to be required for that to really be a useful bulk download as opposed to just, you know, not to fill the need by posting it, but it's a big mess. So uh, I'll give you my personal opinion. Um, and my personal opinion is I would love to have this done properly. And we, we did a two-day workshop that Tom Bruce from Cornell hosted and had a lot of the leading figures that have been working with this data looking at, you know, metadata requirements and document IDs and digital signatures. But at the end of the day, if the judges want to make a bunch of WordPerfect files available through an email gateway, we'll take it because that's better than nothing. Um, and so I, I think uh, what's going to happen in the law.gov report and what I'm going to try to do in that is reflect the, what I've been hearing in all these workshops is that there's some things that are really important. Um, copyright assertions on the data is really important. Uh, paywalls on the dissemination side have a huge effect on the public interest. It's a real problem. Um, 
other things, I, I think there needs to be a mechanism in place for coming up with those standards over time that are adaptable. And while there are a lot of good solutions on the table, I think this is something that needs to be internalized. And there are forums such as the newly reinstituted um, Instituted Administrative Conference of the United States, uh, which Paul Verkul is, is now chairing, uh, that might be in a position to come up with those kinds of guidelines and standards as to what is the minimal subset of data. Uh, the National Center for the Courts, uh, those are the kinds of bodies that I think should be doing those kinds of decisions with a lot of input from the AAAL and the technical community and some of the other folks that are out there. Uh, David, Tim? I have a question for those that did work out the inventory. Did you come across any examples of good available bulk downloads? Are there any administrators out there that say, you know, oh sure, click here and you get the whole thing. You don't have to search the interface. Federal yeah. Register. Well, yeah. Federal Register and Code of Federal Regulations is just doing an amazing job. They took off their paywall. It's an XML. It's digitally signed. Um, you get FTP all the data, and the result has been a whole series of little spin-offs out there that have been taking this data and working with it. Other examples? Not in, not in the state level, so yeah. So there are municipal codes that are PDF the whole thing, and they you know they say go ahead and take it, but none of them are are official. So right. Usually they sell. Tim Stanton. I just want to throw out a couple of random things. Um, one is, it'd be nice to have fences prioritize the uh, If the courts put up the final official version of the text of their opinions, because they always seem to put up flip opinions, but you can never find a digital version of the official opinion anywhere. And it always seems, at least even like the U.S. Federal Appellate Court, I mean, it seems that they can't do it. It sort of sets uh, the tone for the rest of the courts. Uh, so that, that's one item. Uh, the codes. Uh, as we track the codes, it'd be nice to track whether they have multiple years. Like Florida has the code for every single year back in like you know, 12 years or something like that. A lot of folks, like Oregon, when we were sort of discussing things with them, you know, they have the latest version of the code. A lot of times your dispute is about the code two or three years ago, and that's taken down. And so if they can keep up their older versions of the code, there's real value there. And obviously, it'd be nice to have that bulk as well. And then the final thing, sort of tying into a cause analysis point through the security numbers and sort of stuff that you you know, you can't just put it on lawyers with the, to do their filings with it and redact the social security numbers. Because most of these errors are actually going to pro se litigants. And they, this is the only time they ever file something. They don't, they have enough issues going on when they're trying to file something in a federal court. I mean, much less unsure about social security. They have a lot of times going there because they think they have. So there, there's something that needs to be done on the court level beyond just uh, saying, okay, well, we're giving the lawyers and the lawyers. So that was a discussion there. And I, I think that was the message of Professor Stout's um, presentation on access to justice, uh, that the dissemination side is important, but that's integrally tied with the, the filing side and access to materials. So, um, and, and as Tim so rightly points out, that if, if you're worried about social security numbers on the dissemination side, you need to worry about them on the filing side as well. And that's why it's not just a lawyer's problem. Right? It, it really is a systemic problem in, in our legal system. Did we have more comments? Any closing statements? Uh, yes. I have a question on the Federal Register. There's a disclaimer on the on the FEDSIS version that, that the XML is not the official version. Is there sort of a tension there between the, the need to authenticate things and the need to have them in formats that are most easily reusable? Well, so here's the thing with authentication. Um, I, I've been working in the area of XML a long time. I, I helped co-author the authoring the XML authoring language used for internet standards a long time ago. Um, we don't know how to sign, digitally sign an XML document in line, right? Um, we know how to point to an XML document and do what's called an MD5 or a SHA-1, a, a bump print. Um, we do know how to digitally sign a PDF document. And so what, what the um, government printing office has decided to do, and I actually agree with the strategy, is you can download it all in XML, um, and you can repurpose that stuff any way you want. And if you really want to verify the authenticity of three words or five words or, or 100 words, you can pull down this PDF document and look at the digital signature, make sure it's authentic, and you can do your comparison. Um, and I think the issue there is that authentication is not a, a magic switch that gets flipped. It's like security on the internet. It's an ongoing process that's going to have to keep going over time 
involving, um, so for example, if, if you have a digital signature on a PDF document, that's great. But you probably also want to have an HTTPS connection to that server, right? And you probably want to be using secure DNS, if not today, at least in the future, so that you, you're not having a man in the middle attack, right? So that you get a valid signature, but you're talking to a fake server. Um, and that's not going to do you any good at all. And I think one of the messages on security and authentication is it really is a ongoing problem on everything, right? And not one that, that we're going to somehow solve with one magic standard. Um, it's something that we're going to have to pay attention to at a whole bunch of different places in the food chain. Uh, but the, the reason is, is uh, a simple one, that we just don't know how to sign XML documents yet, but not effectively in a way that is widely deployable. Um, whereas a PDF document, we do know how to do that pretty effectively. Any more comments? Uh, Professor Goldman or John, do you have any closing words? Thank you all for coming. There's uh, still some muffins and, uh, and drinks, <laughs> so grab something on the way out. Okay, thank you everybody. We're gonna cut video of this and I'll try to have it up. Uh,